something is changing in the United States about the way the Ukraine war is being portrayed. Even the New York Times now has to admit that not everything is going according to plan and the marriage between Ukraine and the United States is not as happy as it seems. Today there are not one, not two, but three different articles in the New York Times that are surprisingly revealing about a change of a portrayal of the Ukraine war. The first one to point out is this one here. US intelligence stresses risks in allowing long-range strikes by Ukraine. It took them only about two months to now point out what everybody else in the, uh, in the community of Ukraine war watchers has been saying, especially from, the, from those folks who are not in support of further escalation and who do not like the idea of, uh, of nuclear war, that, well, maybe if you strike Russia with long-range missiles, you might actually provoke uh, a, an escalation of the war. <laughs> That's what this report here is saying. It, it's really fascinating, again, because it's being uh, conveyed to us through the idea that this is intelligence, this is, this is something brand new that came out, you know, only the intelligence agencies could have been so smart as to, as to um, figure out what the, what the actual dangers of this situation is. Intelligence agencies concluded that granting Ukraine's re request to use Western missiles against targets deep in Russia could prompt forceful retaliation while not fundamentally changing the course of the war. This is precisely what people like John Mearsheimer, uh, Jeffrey Sachs have been saying, people like uh, Alexander Mercury, Alexander Christopher, everybody who understands anything about how this war is going has been saying that even if you give these long-range missiles, they are not going to make a fundamental difference on the battleground because Ukraine's problems is not the, mi the long-range missiles, it's the lack of people. They don't have soldiers anymore. You don't have infantry, you don't have the necessary uh, tools to implement the war on the battlefield. Giving them weapons to shoot beyond the battlefield and supposedly in, in limited quantities, because there's not that many left, will not change the realities on the ground. And now the New York Times is telling us that finally very smart US intelligence agencies have figured that out. And um, they're also saying that the intelligence assessment was not, has not been previously reported. I mean, it has been absolutely clear that the uh, Defense Department, that the the Pentagon was not happy about this plan. This has been clear now for about four weeks. And we are sold the idea that only now intelligence came out to uh, point to this, uh, to this fact. Um, and apparently, in, in the words of the New York Times, the report also plays down the effect that the long-range missiles will have on the course of the conflict. I find it interesting that they're, that they're using the wording plays down, not reports, not claims, not says that, not assesses that, but plays down. So it seems that the people who write the New York Times still have a little bit of hope inside them that maybe things are gonna, gonna turn around and we're gonna get long, uh, long range missile strikes right into the heart of Russia, which these people long for so much. But um, it seems that reality is seeping in also in the, uh, at the desks of New York Times journalists. The New York Times continues saying that the assessment highlights what intelligence analysts see as the potential risk and uncertain rewards of a high stakes decision. The findings may help explain in part why the decision has been so difficult for Mr. Biden to make. And again, the framing is that by a the framing is that Mr. Biden is still in charge, which by now is absolutely clear he's not. <laughs> this, I mean, it's so cute to think that this old man who cannot run for uh, office anymore, who's too old for, for president, for running for office, still gets to make these decisions. But it shows why the, 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 the people in the background, the Jake Sullivans and the Tony Blinkens, were not able, were not okayed, because there is now serious disagreement inside 
the administration, especially coming from the Pentagon, about the wisdom of such a of such a move. So Mr. Biden was never given the green light, or he was he never had his hand uh, led to sign uh, off on these long range strikes, and that's the first framing. The second one, of, of course, that this is a difficult decision and that it hasn't been made yet. That's always for the last two and a half years how this has been reported on, right? Whenever the uh, neocon establishment wants to escalate, what they do is they, they tout out, they propose some next step in the escalation ladder, and then they criticize the, the political decision makers for not having taken the decision yet. For, for wavering. That's especially how Olaf Scholz is being criticized in Germany for, for not being, not only not being decisive, but for not making a decision. Whenever the decision is made not to do something in these outlets and in the neocon circles, it's being portrayed as not yet. <laughs> and um, but but again, like I think this is this is now the the basically the proof or the indication that the power struggle for these long-range missile strikes on, on Russia is for once being lost because it, it, it now seems that we have too much, too many of these reports saying that um, the administration actually is, is seriously worried. The report says that critics of Mr. Biden and his advisors say they have been too easily intimidated by Mr. Putin's rhetoric. I mean, who in the world would want to believe a uh, nuclear powered uh, a state with nuclear weapons that they would use these nuclear weapons? Um, all of this is, is, of course, just saber rattling, which it, of course it is not. It is playing with fire, and it is absolutely clear that if you shoot at uh, the um, of pre two thousand fourteen Russia with NATO equipment using NATO people and NATO uh, NATO satellites that then uh, Russia will probably try to do something against NATO, right? <laughs> the reports also um, also lauds British leaders for being more decisive. And we know that they've been last week in the US and they wanted to push Biden to, to give his OK. But apparently the White House still said no. At least this article now makes it clear that probably this discussion is, is coming to a close. Um, the report says U.S. officials say the GRU, Russian Military Intelligence Agency, has been responsible for most of the acts of sabotage in Europe that have taken place thus far. If Mr. Putin decides to expand the shadowy campaign in response to the U.S. Uh, to the use of U.S. and European missiles deep inside Russia, U.S. officials believe the Russians will continue to do so covertly rather than con conduct overt attacks on U.S. and European facilities and bases to reduce the risk of wider conflict. This one is quite interesting. If I haven't read this, this interpretation yet. I mean, first, the, these wild allegations of uh, Russia doing these um, uh, um, covert attacks on, on Europe and the US, while we know now that Israel is, of course, just blew up all of these pages and does open attacks. But OK, we have not heard of any concrete sabotage acts of Russia in the West for the last two years. But OK, let's claim that this is the case in order to now um, sell the idea that um, that the Russians might escalate this tactic. This is this is quite fascinating. I don't know why the, the New York Times doesn't go further into the issue of the nuclear threat, but apparently there are people who think in the US, and maybe there's something to it, that uh, that striking Russia would lead to asymmetric retaliation, and that they're actually afraid of this asymmetric retaliation, that they're afraid of what Russia could do in domains other than direct kinetic attacks, at least not open and overt kinetic attacks. So maybe there are strategic vulnerabilities you know, in the US and maybe also of the NATO, uh, NATO system that they know that Russia might take out if pushed to the brink. That would be even more interesting. I have no, I have no idea what that, what that infrastructure could be or what, the, what such a tactics could be. There were talks about maybe Russia could try to attack some British um, ships in the in the Middle East um, because they are basically sitting ducks if um, if uh, storm shadow missiles are being used. But it seems that this this indicates to me that also the U.S. is worried of. Issues that we haven't talked about yet that are below the threshold of nuclear um, of a nuclear attack, but might be detrimental and something that they know that the Russians know. Um, it would be interesting to talk about this with somebody who understands more about the matter. But so 
this is the first article that that now claims that new intelligence has appeared. The second one <laughs> is even more interesting because it connects them to the political level. I'm saying that Zelensky's star power fades on Capitol Hill. After two and a half years, the leader of Ukraine, who was touring the world and was basically received and treated like a rock star, is apparently is apparently kind of on his way out. Um, and I think this is pretty much what it is. It seems to dawn on these people that their rock star and their new Churchill and their hero of the of of this uh, proxy war ain't gonna make it. He's not gonna win. And if he can't win, then you can't be too closely associated anymore. But you can't let them, you can't drop him from one day to the other, to another. That would look bad, right? So it's a slow fading out. Apparently, they want to slowly fade Mr. Zelensky out. The article says that Mr. Zelensky is widely regarded as Ukraine's most persuasive advocate, gifted in his ability to cut through partisan congressional gridlock with appeals to speed weapons and other supplies to Kiev. Well, I mean, a very gifted man, right? Because he keeps demanding more and more weapons. Again, this is this inversion that is happening, right? It is obviously the United States that has been egging on and, and pushing Ukraine into the bayonets of the Russians and 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 has found their useful their useful puppet and, and literally an actor literally not even figuratively literally an actor to do that part and the the inversion is to say that Mr Zelensky was always struggling so much to get to get these weapons and uh, and was selling them so um, was 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 so such a persuasive figure uh, when in fact all the all the um, attempts at, uh, at fortifying Ukraine, of course, are coming directly from the US and NATO. But that's changing now, the article says. But when that military assistance runs out, Ukraine's fate will once again depend in large part on Congress, Congress willingness to keep replenishing Mr. Zelensky's war chest. So, I mean, after having received another 8 billion just recently in, in promises from, from the US, um, it's getting clear that it, it, it just doesn't make a difference anymore. And the European Union also wants to add more money to the, to the war chest, but it is sinking in to these people's minds that this ain't gonna work. Again, the problem is not the equipment, um, although that one is also not going well. The problem is the people. The problem is that the only thing that can turn around the warfare potentially for Ukraine is NATO boots on the ground. That's the only thing at this point that could save the, this, this, this development. And that is something now NATO has again said no. And apparently, apparently, it has sunk in that that means that he is losing. Ukraine is losing and this war is lost. And now this is part of the preparation of them selling the unsuccessful end of the war. And the war will now end in a way that... Um, for the last two and a half years was portrayed as an absolute catastrophe and then you, uh, Europe will, will be next. Um, because the only other option is actual negotiations and a winding down. Um, the, the article, of course, tries to say that Mr. Zelensky um, also made some tactical mistakes, that he tried to, uh, that he displayed favoritism across um, across the aisle and uh, that there's no criticism from the Republicans, that Zelensky um, visited this uh, ammunitions factory in a battleground state, basically supporting the Democrats. And of course, Mr. Zelensky actually had a fallout with, with Trump and, and J.D. Vance, criticized both of them openly. Um, and the Republicans, understandably, don't like that very much. And this is now adding to the, to the headache and the, the political spin that the New York Times has to give to us about um, what's going to happen next. They're ending on, on something slightly uh, delusionally um, uh, positive. When asked by reporters whether he, Mr. Zelensky, could bring the war with Russia to an end, Mr. Zelensky responded affirmatively, of course. We have to. Well, that's about the only, the one thing I can agree with that the, this war absolutely needs to end. That Mr. Zelensky has the possibility, if he removed this um, decree that forbids him from negotiating with Vladimir Putin, to actually sit down. And it seems to me, it seems as if though this scenario is now becoming more and more likely because Mr. Zelensky is now also publicly 
angry at the at the, the Western leaders not embracing his uh, victory plan. The thing that has been out for now a couple of days, uh, Zelensky's victory plan, which is really just um, Ukraine joining you, uh, joining NATO and NATO then uh, in, and then invoking Article Five and NATO sending a boot on the ground and then thereby uh, winning over Russia and scaring Russia into submission. And that is not happening apparently. And thank God, thank God it isn't. Um, we are not over this yet, but it seems so far as if also narratively we are being prepared for this very bitter pill to swallow um, for the people who've been touting this um, this war for the whole time. Um, the last article in this in this series is is basically is going into exactly the same direction that uh, Kamala Harris just met with Mr. Zelensky, anticipating a handover of global crises. Um, it, this is interesting because um, Kamala Harris has been trying to avoid Zelensky and the Ukraine war whenever she could, ever since she became the candidate for the uh, Democratic Party. In a lot of these discussions, she hasn't taken part in. She was not part of the the meeting with um, with the, the Brits the the other day. At least I think no, she wasn't there. I think she wasn't there. I mean, she and she didn't she didn't speak about it. She has been quite silent on on Ukraine as much as possible, which makes sense if you want to be able to distance yourself from the from the mistakes of the previous uh, administration, of which you are an integral part as a vice president. But okay, that was the strategy, and now it seems that it she was forced almost into. Um, actually discussing Ukraine uh, while Zelensky was in was in in Washington, and you can you can read between the lines that this is nothing she's very happy about because she's just reusing these canned sentences, and in a typical Kamala Harris style, makes them even worse. Um, she said that she would ensure Ukraine prevails in the war, adding that President Vladimir Putin of Russia could end the war tomorrow. This sentence is now two and a half years old. Uh, it doesn't get much older than that. Um, and then listen to this one. This is this is fantastic, like fantastic Kamala Harris speech. History is so clear in reminding us, Ms. Harris said, the United States cannot and should not isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. Isolation is not insulation. Yes, Ms. Harris, isolation is not insulation and isolation is also not soundproofing or bulletproofing or waterproofing. <laughs> How many dumb sentences can somebody create? <laughs> I mean, by, by now, this is, um, this, is, this, is, this is pretty sad. I mean, um, the idea that not fighting in a foreign war and that not fighting a proxy war with a nuclear power is the equivalent of isolationism is is beyond laughable it's actually quite sad it's, it's it's really sad because this is the reason this is one of the narratives that has been used in order to um you know fight to the last ukrainian um but but you see how dumb it Getting. And I don't know if this isolation is not insulation, if this is, this is Kamala Harris stupidity, or if this is um, some speech writer, probably speech writer. It's just like, who has the idea that this isolation is not insulation? Who has the idea that this is a good idea? To give her credit, though, it's at least something I haven't heard before. So um, the article continues on, on, other, on other matters, but this is basically the three articles that uh, do tell me that we are nearing, we are nearing a, a new part of this war. It's now clear and it's politically clear and it's getting, it's now politically hardening and, and, and sinking in that the war cannot be won the way the collective West has anticipated it. Um, and that there now must come a shift, and the shift must come for the puppets in Ukraine, for Mr. Zelensky, maybe preparing a, uh, a government in exile, maybe preparing a, a handover in, in, in some sense uh, locally, but certainly preparing now for a military defeat and whatever that will then mean next. We'll wait and see. What's hap what happens? Thank you for joining me today.